Tonight there are going to be three short talks. Um, I'm going to do a bit of an introduction, then there'll be a talk from Cam Camel and Andy, from Shanta City, and then from myself. And um, you might remember that we're in the middle of a series which is looking at the Buddha through space <coughs> and time. And we've been looking a bit about the Buddha, the Buddha's life, around the time of the Buddha, and the early Sangha. And today we're particularly going to be looking at um, um, the women of the early Sangha, um, particularly poems that were written by, um, there are about 75 poems that were written by women um, who were contemporaries of the Buddha, which are in this book, which I'll recommend, it's called The First Buddhist Women. And um, we're all going to be talking about different, different women who wrote poems. But that's somewhere where it doesn't make the uh, microphone go. <laughs> okay, so um, what's in that book actually is a, a selection of um, poems which express the enlightenment experience of a number of different women practitioners. Many of them were friends, family, relatives of the Buddha. Um, and these are actually, they've been, apparently they may well be the earliest collection of women's poetry um, in any religion, you know, any kind of, their, their religious poems, and they might be the earliest collection that there is, and, um, which is quite interesting. So, what are they? So, um, they're called the Terry Garter, and Terry means something like wise women or um, elders, experienced women, and Garter means songs. So they're very short songs, very short poems, and they're in a particular style. It's quite a kind of rigorous and conventional style that everybody used, the same rhythms, the same rhymes. But it might be that those rhythms and those rhymes were just a way that was adapted for the actual stories to be passed down. Because there were 600 years that these stories were just passed down in the oral tradition before they were actually written down. So we don't know if the nuns themselves all wrote poetry in this particular style, or whether this is just expressing what they felt and then it's remembered in a particular way. What we also don't know, of course, is um, in this book there are a number of different women um, who were mentioned. We don't actually know if they really wrote those poems or not, um, if they really said those things or not. And interestingly, actually, to them, I don't think it would have particularly mattered, because they came from quite a different culture than we do, a much less individualistic culture. So who was the author of each poem wasn't particularly of interest to them. And in fact, I think in that time, in that kind of culture, people wouldn't have thought, you know, um, it'd be wrong to say somebody else's words. There wasn't that kind of thing that we have where we identify with being the particular author of a work and we feel that somebody owns a particular collection of words. They didn't feel like that at all. I think that's quite interesting, actually, because that kind of challenges me a little bit because I've got whole ideas about, you know, authorship and who owns different words and things like that and who says things. And um, I'd like to say things that are kind of important, if you see what I mean. And it's kind of like, I quite like that idea, that actually. It's the words themselves that matter, but who said them doesn't really matter so much. Okay, so, um, so these women um, left home and went to live either in the forests, in the woods, individually, or actually after a while they started to form communities, small communities of nuns living together. And they lived in poverty, um, outside villages, going round the village every morning for alms, begging for their food. Um, living together, practicing together. And, um, having experiences of enlightenment together, or separately, which were then written down and passed down to us through these poems. And they come from all sorts of backgrounds. Some of them are very poor, some of them wealthy, some of them educated, some of them not. Um, many of them, as I said, relatives of the Buddha or friends of the Buddha, they knew him. Quite a number of them, interestingly, came from the Buddha's harem. Harem? I don't know how you say harem. Anyway, um, before the Buddha became um, enlightened, before he left home, like um, you know, other rich men of, his, um, of that time, he had a wife, but he also had a harem of, of women as well. Which is interesting, because I think that brings up a really good point, that um, although the Buddha was very clear that women have exactly the same capacity for enlightenment as men, the same ability to progress spiritually, he did live in a particular society where there was a particular vision of women, which is different from ours in the West at the moment where um, women were very much seen in relationship to men. They didn't have the same independence that we might take for granted for ourselves. And um, I think that will come across in some of the stories that we hear, that these are women who don't have the same choices that some of us in the West have today. 
And um, I think Kamala Nandi in particular is going to talk about that. And I think that in some ways, many of these women, well, would have lived quite difficult lives. It was a time when there wasn't contraception. Um, there was a time when there wasn't much to help with the um, with everyday work in the house. It could have been quite a life of drudgery if you weren't a rich woman. And um, perhaps quite a short life as well, quite different from our time. But I think the important thing to me is that the Buddha really did believe that, um, you know, that women are equal to men in terms that we have the same ability to, um, to attain enlightenment. So that's just kind of like an introduction to these nuns, these elders, these wise women who we're going to, we're going to hear more about now. So we'll start with Carolyn and Andy. So I'm going to talk about Maha Prachapti Gotami. Maha Prachapti Gotami. And she was the maternal aunt of the Buddha. Um, and she was also the Buddha's foster mother, because the Buddha's mother died shortly after childbirth. So she raised him um, and, uh, and would have actually seen him go off and uh, not come back for an awful long time. So the story goes um, that the Buddha was staying amongst the Shakyan tribe in Kapilavastu, which was the capital city of the Shakyans. And the Buddha was a Shakyan, that was his tribe. Um, and as such, Jyoti said, a lot of his uh, family members actually decided to go forth. And there were many amongst the monks who were from his household. Ananda, who we hear a lot about, was his cousin. Ananda was his main man, his, sort of, his attendant. So um, Mahaprachapati heard that he was in town and, um, and, and decided to go and pay him a visit, um, but with a very, very big question. So she went to visit him and she asked him if she could be ordained, if she could become a nun. And there weren't Buddhist nuns. Um, the Buddha had set up, uh, he had his followers, people had gone forth, it was just monks. Um, there were probably plenty of female lay followers, but there were no nuns. So this was a big ask. And the story goes that she asked him three times and three times he said no and told her not to ask for such a thing. And apparently she went away weeping, wailing and sobbing. But later on, uh, she heard that he was staying um, at Vaishali and she decided to pay him another visit. But this time she wasn't alone. She decided to take 500 other women with her. <laughs> she shaved her head, she put on saffron robes and she went to pay a visit. And Ananda saw her coming and went to greet her and asked her what she wanted. Um, and he said, I'll take your question to the Buddha. Three times the same question, can I become a nun? Went to the Buddha and three times the Buddha said no, not to ask for such a thing. So Ananda decided he'd take her case and he went back to the Buddha and he said, Lord, would it be possible if a woman were to go forth from home to a homeless state, were she to practice the same practices, would it be possible for her to attain the same as a man? And the Buddha said, yes. So Ananda said, well, will you not ordain Mahaprachapati go to me then? And he also added that she had suckled him at her breast. And, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so he said, yes, but, according to the story, yes, but, only if she take on eight additional vows, in addition to the extra vows and rules that the monks were abiding by at the time. <coughs> Those rules are summarised thus. That they should receive instruction from monks, and even the most senior nun should defer to and perform all proper duties towards the most junior monk. So, um, I've got a few questions about this. The first is, why did the Buddha say no? <laughs> I find I struggle with it. I really struggle. When I hear that story, I'm just like, oh, <laughs> what was that about? I find that really, really hard. And something that's helped me, actually, is reading this book. And I would really recommend this. This book, Go to a Buddha by Vishapani, is um, just a fantastic attempt at really contextualising the Buddha's life right in the socio-historic context, right in what was happening at the time. And it's been a real eye-opener for me, and actually a real way of getting closer to the Buddha, actually. Um, but there's, a, there's something that he quotes in here, talking about this whole period. Um, and I'm just going to quote it straight at you. So the Brahminical view, so Brahminical, so that's like 
the Brahmin way is like a predecessor to what we see as Hinduism now. So the Brahminical view, as expressed in the laws of Manu, was that a woman should do nothing independently, even in her own house, in childhood subject to her father, in youth to her husband, and when her husband is dead to her sons, so she should never enjoy independence. So, as Sachi Jyoti said, this is sort of what was going on at the time. That's how it was. That was the culture at the time. Very different to what our experience is now of men and women and what our rights and responsibilities are in our culture. So, all I can think is, if the Buddha did say no, it was because this was going to be a big deal. Um, if women were going to leave their homes and become nuns, it was going to have an effect, not just a ripple, but it was going to be quite a big deal. Um, and the villages and communities at the time were going to have something to say about that. I don't think they were going to want to see their women getting up and going off <laughs> and leaving everything behind, you know, and saying, I'm not doing that anymore, I'm going to follow the Buddha. You know, it's going to have a big effect. It was one thing for the men to do it, but for the women to do it, it'd be like, that was going to be a big deal. So I think if, if the Buddha did actually say no, I think that maybe that's why, because he could see what an effect that might have at the time. And well, what's with these extra rules? Um, there already were rules coming into place. Um, now, within the sort of monastic traditions in Buddhism around the world, there's something very laid down, which is the Vinaya. Um, and they're the rules on how monks and nuns should be, you know, how they should sort of carry themselves um, and ways that they should live. So why, why did the women have to have extra rules? Um, there are two elements to these rules. One is that they, um, they would effectively be subservient to the monks, and the other is that they shouldn't go anywhere on their own. <clears throat> and that actually served a very practical purpose, because as one finds out later, as the um, order of nuns grew, they were very vulnerable to attack and assault, and people did, some people did really have a problem with them, with them having leave, left home. And um, there were, you know, cases of rape and attack. So that was about physical protection, and that sort of made sense. But the whole subservience thing, yeah, I'm not so sure about that. And I think that anyone in this room, a man or woman who calls himself feminist, is probably going to think, mm, I'm not so sure about that either. What was that about? Well, I listened to a talk by Bante about this. Um, his talk's called The Reef of Blue Lotus, and it's about this whole episode. And his take is that they were proposed in order to prevent women from going forth for the wrong reasons. Um, that it could well be possible that somebody might decide to, to, to become a nun to escape an unhappy marriage. Um, or because maybe she'd become a widow and that would mean you no longer had any rights or status in your family. Um, or maybe her, she'd not been able to find a husband so was effectively of no worth in her family. Um, so his take is maybe it was like an extra barrier just to say, look, are you really sure? Are you really, really sure? You know, and to sort of make it a little bit harder. But I find that interesting in itself because, well, what we do know is that the early nuns were, you know, were widows, were prostitutes, were people who'd had a terrible time at home. And, well, yeah, well off women as well and people who hadn't had such a hard time. But there were women who were going forth from difficult situations. Um, so it, it, could, it was very possible and it, was very, it, was, it seems to have actually happened that there were mixed motives in what were, you know, people were being inspired to leave, leave the home and go forth. There was a case of a, a nun called Kanda who, she was a widower and she was destitute, her family kicked her out, she was, she was living on nothing. And she saw a load of nuns going from village to village and they had their bowls nice and full and they looked well and she was like, well, what's with this? You know, I'm, I'm struggling and you guys are doing really well. I just want what you've got. Um, and that, that was it. She wanted to become a nun and actually she, you know, she, she took up the practices and she went on to gain enlightenment. So, um, yeah. <laughs> the other thing to bear in mind about this whole thing about the Buddha saying no and about the extra rules is um, another interesting thing that comes up in this book by Vishwapani. And I'm just going to read it out here as well. So he says, there is considerable deba debate today about whether these eight rules were actually pronounced by the Buddha or were later inserted by monks. Others like Richard Gombrich also believe that the story of the Buddha's reluctance to allow women into the Sangha does not date from his lifetime. So we just don't know. We don't really, we don't really know. We have to make this what we can. 
But for me, I'm quite interested in what Mahaprajapati Gautami was like. So she'd watched her family around her leave to follow the Buddha, and she was moved to do the same, and she was clearly a gutsy, committed character. So she didn't get her way. She cried and made a fuss and returned, and effectively presented the Buddha with a fait accompli, which is how Bhante describes it in his lecture. Um, he describes her behaviour um, in uh, the lecture with the Blue Lotus as essentially unskillful because she really pushed her case and forced his hand. And maybe she did, <laughs> we don't know. But what we do know is that it paid off. So she took these extra vows and actually later requested that some of them be changed more in favour of the nuns when it was clear that some monks were being more disrespectful to their sisters. And along with all the 500 women that she brought along with her, she eventually went on to attain complete and perfect enlightenment. And she was also responsible for teaching and training many other women, and we hear her name pop up a lot through the Buddhist canon. So I'll read a little bit from her Song of Enlightenment. Oh, but tis long I've wandered down all time, living as mother, father, brother, son, and as grandparent in the ages past, not knowing how and what things really are, and never finding what I needed saw. But now mine eyes have seen the exalted one, and now I know this living frames the last, and shattered is the unending round of births, no more Prachapati shall come to be. So she had mixed motives, possibly, um, but it paid off. And I can relate to that because when I asked for ordination, I really had mixed motives. <laughs> and I just had to work my way through that. And I think a lot of us have mixed motives when we come to the spiritual life. That's just how it is. And I think somewhere Bhante says, if you wait around for a pure motive, nothing's ever going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so the fact that she did it, in my mind, is an inspiration in itself. And I also think, actually, it doesn't really make sense that there would only have ever been an order of monks. I mean, sooner or later it was going to happen, wasn't it? You know, if you think about the Dharma and what it says, and the fact that the Buddha was very, very clear, very, very clear that there was no difference in the potential for spiritual attainment between men and women. It was going to happen sooner or later, but she did it. <coughs> and she had to fight a bit. And I can relate to that because my experience of you know, history and women is that it's been a bit of a fight. And men and women have had to fight for women to have the rights that we have now. So I can relate to the fact that it might have been a bit of a fight. But also it links me to my place in the Buddhist world now and how happy I am to be in a movement where we don't have an issue with whether women are, are allowed, you know, and whether there's any difference in what we can achieve. That's not the question right now. We also go one further in Dhruva than a lot of other Buddhist schools and movements because we have an equal ordination process for men and women. And we've been having women ordaining women since 1989, and that's still a very unusual thing. So whatever the truth of this story might be, as a woman practicing the Dharma, I see a lineage of nuns going right back to Mahabhachava to go to me and right back to the Buddha. And I'm very proud to be part of that. The nuns you hear about their kind of domestic situation before before they become nuns. Mm -hmm. So this one's quite a simple story, it's not very dramatic, but it moves me strangely. I'm not quite sure why, except she's she's described as an old lady, so I mean that's kind of obvious, isn't it? But probably an old lady in India at the time, she was probably 50, 40. <laughs> anyway. Um, but I do think it has things that really, uh, well, I can learn from, otherwise why would I read it really? And the things that I take from it are about the sort of effort to make, because I invariably make lots and lots of the wrong sort of effort, and keep on, if it doesn't work, do more of it. 
and, um, and it's about meta. Fooling yourself that you're feeling meta when you're not at all. So that was a kind of, that's enough really. So, Sona lived at Travesty and she had 10 children. Probably wasn't that unusual then, but 10 seems quite a lot to me. So you can just get a feel for her life really. She must have had years and years of being pregnant, breastfeeding, bringing up the children, cooking, cleaning, looking after everybody, managing the household, looking after her husband's family, just kind of non-stop. But a very important person in that setting. Um, and then of course the children grown up, so she's got to arrange all their marriages and then she's got to uh, interfere with the, how they're bringing up their children. <laughs> so, yeah, a busy life, a kind of a satisfying life in many ways, a successful life in her terms. And they were prosperous by then because the children had all left home. So what could possibly go wrong? Okay, so this is a story. Her husband, he'd been a lay disciple of the Buddha for quite some time. And they'd reached a point where he thought, well, actually, we're doing all right financially. I can leave her, you know, so will be fine. I'll go off and become a monk. Well, okay, she was all right financially, but she was not happy. But there wasn't a lot she could do about it. If he decided to become a monk, well, there you go. So what she decided to do was that she'd live a more devout life. She wasn't going to go off and be a nun. She wasn't interested. But she'd give more time to her practice. And in order to do that, she called all her children together, all 10 of them, plus all their 10 partners, so 20 people. Um, and she said what she'd like to do was hand over all her money, which they didn't, they thought was a good idea, and that in return, they just kind of look after her basic needs. So she didn't need to worry about all that. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so, I guess you can imagine what happened. All went well at first. You know, she probably did the rounds. And uh, they all kind of looked after mum and she was right and stuff. But, they hadn't thought very much of their dad going off. They thought it was a bit crazy. They thought even less of her. They thought their parents had lost it, basically. Because there they were, they'd got a comfortable setup. They could have a nice sort of retirement, really. Take it easy, enjoy their good fortune. And what did they do? They went off to the Buddha. So not only did they not particularly like having to look after mum, but they thought she'd lost it. They thought she was just a silly old woman, basically, who got funny ideas. So increasingly, they just got more and more off hand with her, more and more critical, more and more irritated by everything she did. And just to speak up for them for a minute, I imagine she wasn't that easy. You know, she'd be the linchpin of the family all those years. She was used to telling people what to do. She knew the way things ought to be done, etc. Can you just imagine? Her poor old daughter-in-law's, you know, kind of, oh, here she comes, she's going to tell me off again. So, even so, they had forgotten. They just lost sight of the fact that she had looked after them all those years. You know, she kept them fed and watered and reasonably happy. So, there she was. She'd been hurt when her husband left, but she was even more hurt when they all left. Because they'd been her life's work in a way, they'd been her purpose, what she's doing. So she felt very bitter. Um, you know, how could they be so mean? After all she'd done for them, you know, you can hear the voice, can't you? After all I've done for you, that you should treat me like that. It's so unkind. But even worse than that was that she realised that she'd been wrong about herself. She thought she'd been really loving, you know, a lovely mum, looked after them all, selflessly, just doing whatever everybody else wanted, not putting herself there. And what she found out when they were so ungrateful 
was that she hadn't been selfless at all. You know, she looked after them, but she had, in the back of her mind, thought, well, of course they'll be grateful. Of course they want me to be part of their lives when they're grown up and left home. Of course they will look after me. So she was really, really horrified at their behaviour, but also about her kind of her whole assumptions that she hadn't been the, the person she thought she was. So she had to do something quite radical because she just kind of her whole life had, had gone really, her whole purpose. So the obvious thing to do, for all the wrong reasons, talking about motivation again, was to go off and be a nun. I mean, she might have had good motivation, but she's sure as eggs it must have been mixed, mustn't it? So, you know, she had lost her, her self-view, really. Well, it had been very badly shaken, anyway. She'd lost her sense of what her life was about. And, well, her life was pretty horrible. Because, yes, they just about put a roof over her head, but they didn't make her feel welcome and didn't really care for her. So she must have been pretty desperate, desperate for some comfort, for some kindness. Well, if you want comfort, maybe running away to the nuns is not the best idea you've ever thought of. You no, know, they lived in the forest, they went on begging rounds, they didn't have anything. Anyway, <laughs> she was desperate. <laughs> and I suppose what she was also, her, her more positive motivation, was that she was beginning to see that she got things wrong. That she wasn't the person she thought she was and that she needed to see things differently. She needed to, she had things to learn from the nuns. Maybe she could be as selfless as she saw them be. Maybe she could, love, she could learn to be more loving in a genuine way. Well, it wasn't easy. How could it have been easy, actually? So she's an old woman. <coughs> she knows how things ought to... She knows how to run a household. She knows how to tell people what to do. So she goes into her new life with all her old habits with her and all her opinionatedness and all her sense of herself. I can't think... I mean, I'm not speaking from personal experience. I don't know what that's like at all. <laughs> And what she met in the Sangha, of course, in, in the Order of Nuns, was a lot of women who were half her age, but who had experience of a spiritual life, who had experience of living together, experience of the Sangha, which she didn't have. And it wouldn't have taken very long before they started criticising her, or rather giving her helpful feedback, I beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> Showing her you know, what she was actually like, rather than how she hoped she was. So, she hadn't found a, an easy haven to run to at all. She found somewhere really challenging. She realised that she would just have to, well, for a start she'd have to learn to think. She'd have to think clearly about other people and herself and how she was behaving. She had to learn to, um, well, to see. She'd been very credulous with her children. She hadn't really thought it through. And now she was living on her old habitual patterns. She wasn't seeing that this was an opportunity to do something different. So I think probably the first thing she realised after she thought, oh heck, I can't go back now, was this is going to cost, her, cost me a lot of effort. If I'm going to make any progress spiritually, I'm going to have to really put some effort in. Probably didn't even know quite what that entailed, but just that it was going to be hard, hard to change. Well, she'd always been energetic, hadn't she, all those ten children? But this was a kind of different sort of energy that she hadn't really uh, experienced before. Um, she had to really learn what the Dharma meant to her. She had to really learn how to engage, how to see herself, how to engage with her habits, how to work on things. 
What she had in her favour was a sense of urgency, because she knew she didn't have that long to live. She was getting on, so she really went for it. And what she did was, obviously she'd learned the meditation practices, she'd learned what um, the nuns had to teach her, and she practiced, 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 practiced. So she often stayed up all night, and she walked and meditated and meditated and walked. She didn't sit non-stop. But of course it was dark. So when she was walking, doing her walking meditation, she had to grab hold of the, in the, in the shrine hall, there were pillars, so she had to grab hold of the pillars to stop herself from falling over or tripping over things and stuff. And that's what she did. And she hardly slept, she just did that all night, so I told her. So she was one determined lady once she got kind of pointing in the right direction. In fact, the Buddha praised her. He, he, he often praised the nuns for particular qualities, and the monks for a particular quality that was theirs. And hers was her energy, her virya. Um, in fact, it's suggested that there's some, the, in the Dharma part of the room, verses, uh, which are very um, early verses, in praise of various things, and these are supposed to be about her. It says, though one should live for a hundred years, idle and inactive, yet better is a single day's life of one who makes an intense effort. So that's so for you, intense effort. So, one day, because we don't know a huge amount about her life, but one day, all the other nuns had gone out, Perhaps they were walking further on their baking ground or whatever, and they left her alone. And they just asked her while they were gone, could she put on a cauldron of water to boil? So she got a great big cauldron, and she went off and fetched water and filled it up, put it on the stove to boil. And then she just sat watching it, just watching the water. It's fascinating actually, isn't it? It just starts moving a little bit, and then it starts. Anyway, she was engrossed, and as she was sitting quietly, she was reflecting, and she was reflecting that all the scandals, all the parts of her, like her thoughts, her feelings, her physical body, was in a constant state of change, that none of it was permanent. She wasn't permanent. There wasn't any fixed sona to find. There wasn't any confusion left in her mind, and there wasn't any of that negativity blaming that she'd had. In other words, she became enlightened. And what she said, I haven't got you all the verses, but just the last verses, the five standards, five parts of herself, are fully understood. They stand cut off at the root. Fie on you, O wretched aging. Now there is no more re-becoming. So that's her story. And just a couple of things that I'd like to draw out about it. Um, let's see if I can find where I've written them, of course. So first of all, this definitely isn't an anti-family story. There was nothing wrong in the fact that she looked after her family and she loved her family. And um, that's where her energy went. Um, I love my family. It's got to be okay, isn't it? No, I mean, it's fine. Um, <laughs> but there's more. There's more than that. We can be bigger than that. Um, and I think when you, when you come into contact with the Sangha, you see that there can be more than that. You can be less possessive of your friends. Because they've got friends and you're not possessive, you're not jealous of their friends. Um, there's lots of us, and there's lots of different people. Um, so when we join a Sangha, it can be a bit bumpy, actually, I, I can remember, because you can see, just as Sona did, I can remember seeing how I hold back, how I think, well, you know, I know who loves me, it's not any of you lot. You know, you sort of, you retire to your safe place. And you can also see that, um, there can be more of you, that you haven't really, you know, you spent your life without kind of quite seeing. So that can be pretty uncomfortable. 
and yet you haven't quite moved into the Sangha either, so you're a bit afloat for a while. But luckily we're taught practices, and luckily we've all been there, so we know what it's like joining the Sangha a bit. And when you practice the Metta Bhavna, you kind of stretch those heart muscles, don't you? You stretch your imagination towards other people, and you let them in more, and a wider range of people. All those people in the third stage that you thought you weren't interested in. It kind of it changes. So, so we have an insight practice that can lead us just like Soma. She, through practicing metta, through getting her head around those younger nuns who were a bit uppity and didn't understand how important she was, she changed her mind about them. She felt metta towards them. And that led her to breaking down the barrier between herself and other people. Um, and that's, that's it. That took her to enlightenment, didn't it? She saw through her fixed sense of herself. She saw through the way she kept herself apart from other people. So there we go. We've got the tools for that. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to draw out was the difference between all the effort we put into our ordinary lives, most of it isn't optional, but some of it is. We put a lot of effort into that. Um, and there's the other sort of effort that's going to transform us. And that's what fear is, energy in pursuit of the good, not energy in pursuit of paying off the mortgage or whatever. So energy in meditation, energy in friendship, energy in challenging our own views say that to you and I think, well, Shantasiddhi, stop dashing about, stop being busy. Uh, you know, if I could only do that, then I could put the real work in. But somehow it's always easier to dash about and be busy. So, just to finish with, tell you, do you remember the other Soma, the more famous Soma who played the lute? Some of you have heard this story. He played the lute. And the, the Buddha asks him, uh, what does your lute sound like if the strings are too tight? And so he goes, and what's it like if they're too loose? I don't know, I can't imitate that kind of word. <laughs> <laughs> Quite so, though. You know, that's the point. Don't try too hard, don't try not enough. Just the right amount of effort. So I, you know, I'm really fond of so, and I really like that story. It kind of gives me a way to be. But I think this sermon is a bit more challenging, a bit more uncomfortable, because this story suggests you just have to be more wholehearted. Never mind loose strings or tight strings. Just put the effort in. I don't like that very much. But she got enlightened. She did just that. She did what she the practices she learned, and she got enlightened. So there you go. We've got the practices, we know what to do. Let's go for it. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to finish by telling um, a story of one of the other nuns. And this is a story you may have heard before. It's a story, a story of Kisa Gotome. And um, Kisa go to me. She faced one of um, <laughs> she faced one of the hardest things that a human person has to bear. And it's interesting because last night I went to see the film Gravity, um, which is a very interesting. It's a beautiful film, beautiful, really worth seeing. Though the story's a bit kind of shaky in points. But there's a really important part of the story, which is about um, the character that's played by Sandra Bullock. Is um, her daughter has died, and she's trying to come to terms with the death of her daughter. And that's the same thing that Kisa Gautami is trying to come to terms with. She's kind of trying to come to terms with the death of her child. So um, Kisa Gautami um, was a contemporary of the Buddhas, part of his extended family in some way. And um, she, um, Kisa literally means skinny or thin. Okay? And I think being skinny or thin wasn't, a kind of, wasn't seen in the same way as it is today in the West. <laughs> To hear it would be a bit of a compliment, no, to say you've been known as skinny. But at that time, it probably meant she came from quite a poor background and um, she hadn't had enough to eat. 
But anyway, she managed to uh, make a good marriage. She married into a wealthier family. However, she found when she got there into a new family that she wasn't treated very well by her in-laws at all. She had to do all the kind of work in the house. Um, her mother-in-law was pretty horrible to her, that kind of stuff. After some time, she gave birth to a son and her life changed dramatically because now she um, was the mother of a son of the family. She had a lot of status and as well as that, she had this lovely little boy to love, to play with, to look after. So she was happy. She was happy in her family, happy with her son. But sadly, after just a few years, when he was just a little toddler, um, he became ill and he died. And she was completely devastated, completely devastated. It was like everything that she knew, everything that made her happy, had come to an end. So devastated that she couldn't believe it, she couldn't accept it. So um, what she did in her desperation, in her unhappiness, is she carried the dead body of the child with her and went round the villages asking everybody, please, can somebody help me? Is there somebody who's got something that can help my child, can make my child better? And the villagers didn't know what to say. What could they say when they obviously when they saw what was going on? Until an old man said to her, there's someone called the Buddha who is, um, is, is he's staying just outside the village. Why not go and visit him and ask him? So still carrying the dead child, she went to, um, to see the Buddha. So the Buddha was there sitting with his monks and um, in comes this devastated figure carrying a child. I don't know what, you know, what would you have done? What would you have said to somebody who comes to you for help in that situation? And what he did say might seem a bit surprising, but um, when Kizagotomi had said to him, Buddha, please help me, please make my child well again, he said to her, okay, I'll do what I can to help you, but first, go into the village, and go to a house and bring me back a mustard seed from a house where no one has died. So she thought, great, a mustard seed. Everybody in India has got mustard seeds in their house. Soon my baby will be well again, everything will be fine. So she went to the first house and she knocked on the door and she said um, to the woman who answered, she said, please, could I have a, mus a mustard seed? And the woman said, yes, of course, I'll, I'll go and get one for you. But Kisa goes to me and said, well, just one thing though, has anybody here died? And the woman said, oh yes, many people in this house have died. Very recently, my, um, my, father, my, my husband's father died. We're just, we're just um, going through the morning for that. And Kisa goes to me and said, oh, okay. Went to another house. She went to another house. A woman answered the door. She said to the woman, please, could I have mustard seed? Uh, but I need, you know, has anyone in this house ever died? The woman said, yes, um, very recently um, my sister died in childbirth. So Kisa go to me couldn't take the mustard seed from that house. So she went from house to house around the village, still carrying her dead child. And gradually she realised that there was no house in that village where no one, um, where the, where no one had not died. So um, what that allowed her to do was she realised that, um, well, all of us will experience bereavement. All of us will experience suffering. It's part of the human condition. Um, it is, it's, it's part of something that all of us, that can connect us if we allow it to. And that allowed her, that realisation allowed her to see that her child had died and to take it to the burial ground, take him to the burial ground and to bury him and to let him go, to put him down, to literally put him down and let him go. She then went to the Buddha and thanked the Buddha and said to the Buddha, um, I'd like to join your community. I'd like to become a nun in your community and I'd like to dedicate my life to the Dharma, to the Sangha and to you. And he took her into the community and she went to, um, to join, join a community of nuns. So, um, well, what does that story mean to me? I think in some ways it's kind of beyond, it's a story that stands on its own. But what I particularly pull out from it is, um, first of all, the skill of the Buddha. So um, she went in this desperate state. She, was, um, she wasn't in her right mind. She wasn't seeing clearly. She had a dead child with her. And he didn't try and talk her out of it. Okay? He didn't say, oh, come on, Kisa, go to me. Impermanence, you know. Come on. You know, you've heard about that before. Here it's happened to you. Get over it, kind of thing. <laughs> he didn't say that at all. And nor did he kind of say, 
come here, I'll give you a big hug and I'll make it all all right. Okay, he didn't do either of those two things. What is he, did, he did was he allowed her, gave her the tools to go out and experience for herself the universality of, of what had happened to her. And I think that's how it is for me in, in um, learning the Dharma, in really bringing it into my heart and into my life. Is I have to experience it for myself. And, um, yeah, so I've been thinking a little bit about sort of various thick times when I've um, experienced suffering and how that's been. I think the first one is um, ageing, the suffering of ageing. And I think probably when I had about my 25th birthday is when I first thought, oh my God, I'm getting really old now. <laughs> 25 and my life is over and what have I done with it? <laughs> and then gradually, on every big birthday after that, you know, 30, 40 and 50, the kind of same things have come up. And gradually things have happened. My hair has lost its colour. I'm much more wrinkly. Recently, horror of horrors, I've started to pull weight on around my waist. And it's like these are things that somehow I thought were going to happen to other people. And they weren't going to happen to me. I wasn't ever going to, uh, to get old. And I presume it just carries on like this as, as I get stiffer, you know, things I get more tired, all that kind of stuff. It will continue like this. But there is something in, and each of those big birthdays, when I've come, actually I've sort of accepted the fact I'm ageing, okay? Actually, I've accepted the fact, you know, my hair is grey or, um, or whatever it is. Um, and I've also developed more of a compassion and more of an understanding for other people who are also ageing and seen them in quite a different light, actually. So I think that links to Kids Go To Me in a way because it's about like accepting, realising what's happening and somehow letting it go, letting it go as a personal experience but realising it's a universal experience. And another example for me is um, about six months ago, um, a very long relationship I'd been in for about 17 years, we split up. And um, at first, I was just like Kisa to me. It's like, I wouldn't put it down. <laughs> I really wouldn't put it down. It's like, wherever I went and whoever I talked to, I wanted to tell them the story of this breakup and what happened to me. And it's completely understandable. I mean, I'm really not putting myself down for it. That's what we do as human beings. But it's somehow, over the time, gradually, I've been able to move away from being completely in my suffering, where I couldn't see anything else, and I couldn't relate to other people, but apart from in terms of that, and somehow I've let myself put it down, accept it, let go, and re use it when I can remember to relate to other people as, as we've all had losses. You know, all of us, whatever our lives have been like, it's part of the human experience to suffer. It's part of the ex human experience to, to lose things, to lose uh, relationships. And I think that, you know, what we can do with the Dharma is we can really try and reflect on that and reflect on what happens to us as um, a seeing impermanence as it really is, I suppose. Um, Sangha Rachita, who founded this, uh, this movement, um, someone once said to him, so what's different about you, Sangha Rachita? Why are you different from other people? Because he has, you know, he's uh, written loads of books and he's created this whole movement. He's done some amazing things in his life. And he said, well, I'm not really that different. But what I do every night is I reflect on the day and I learn from what I've experienced that day. And I think there's something really powerful in that. If we can make time to reflect, we can learn. We can then apply the things that we learn here to our lives. So we can actually apply the Dharma to our lives. And then we can learn, we can change. Anyway, I'll just um, finish off with a little bit about um, Kisa Gotemi's, um poem. So she went away and practiced for many years with her sisters, with her nuns. And, um, and then this poem, or this song, is associated with her. And this is a great translation. I had to use this translation because I love some of the words in it. Okay. So it says, Then early in the morning, Kisa go to me the nun, put on her robes, and taking her bowl and her outer robe, she went into Sarvati for alms. When she'd gone for alms in Sarvati and had returned from her alms round, after her meal, she went to the Grove of the Blind to spend the day. Having gone deep into the Grove of the Blind, she sat down at the foot of a tree for the day's abiding. Then Mara, the evil one, wanting to arouse fear, horripilation, and terror in her, wanting to make her fall away from concentration 
approached her and addressed her in verse. Why, with your son killed, do you sit all alone, your face in tears, all alone, immersed in the midst of the forest? Are you looking for a man? <laughs> it's really cheeky of Mara. <laughs> she was like, what are you doing here? You must be looking for a man. <laughs> Anyway, then in, it goes back to the translation. <laughs> then the thought occurred to Kisa go to me the nun. Now, who has recited this verse? A human being or a non-human one? Then it occurred to her, this is Mara, the evil one, who has recited this verse, wanting to arouse fear, horripilation and terror in me, wanting to make me fall away from concentration. Thus, having understood that this is Mara, the evil one, she replied to him in verses. I've gotten past the killing of sons, have made that the end of my search for men. I don't grieve, I don't weep, and I'm not afraid of you, my friend. It's everywhere destroyed, delight, the mass of darkness is shattered. Having defeated the army of death, free of fermentations I dwell. So that's her experience of enlightenment, that's seeing through. And Mara, the evil one, sad and dejected at realising, Kisa go to me, the nun knows me, vanished right there. <laughs> <laughs> so, for people who haven't, haven't met Mara before, he's worth getting to know. <laughs> um, he's the embodiment of everything that gets away, gets in the way of our enlightenment. So he's what gets in the way of us meditating, gets in the way of us reaching out to people, being kinder, being more open, more aware. And um, what's great is because he's embodied as a figure, we can externalise our thoughts. So it's a way that we can stop identifying with our thoughts if we call them Mara. So um, if we have doubts, we have self-criticism, we can say, ah, Mara, I see you. <laughs> And then Mara quite often just goes, oh, and slinks away. And, um, I certainly found that sometimes, you know, like, my thoughts can be really unhelpful. And particularly, actually, I think when we do suffer and we get into depression, that was my experience, we can fall back into some old ways of doing things. So recently, I've really suffered from a lot of unhelpful thoughts, of just, like, comparing myself with other people, which really doesn't get you anywhere. Um, wanted to hide away, all that kind of thing. You know that thing when your own thoughts are like daggers to yourself? And, um, well, I did try for a little while being very psychological about it and kind of like, you know, well, I have very critical parents, blah, 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 that kind of stuff. And then I just thought, you know, if I call it Mara, it can really change the situation because I don't have to kind of get into the whys and wherefores. I just can go, ha, I see you, Mara. And um, off he goes. So, <laughs> hopefully not always, but that's a good problem. Okay, so um, just to sum up, um, for me at the moment, I mean the Kisagotama story, I think is, you know, it is one of the great Buddhist stories actually, and it has lots of layers of meaning. But for me at the moment, it's got three main teachings. So the first is about the skillfulness of the Buddha, and um, that we only learn through our own experience, and through reflecting on our experience. That it doesn't matter how much dharma we know, if we don't apply it to life, it won't get us anyway. Okay? And it doesn't matter what life experiences we have, if we don't apply the dharma to them, again, we won't learn from them. It's like the two things need to work together. Secondly, that when we suffer, we can use it to connect with others rather than disconnect. And that we can relate to the whole human, we can understand all of us, whatever it looks like, kind of life we're leading, all of us suffer as human beings. And we can also um, relate to our own self-criticisms, our doubts, those little daggers, by externalising them as Mara and just seeing them off. <laughs>